you know, somebody comes to me with a question and it's not just giving them the direction on what to do next, but it's focusing on the why. Why would we want to be able to do something this way and what are the results of that? And so every question that comes to me is an opportunity to learn. Welcome to People Who Perform, the Real Estate Careers Podcast. Each episode will bring you conversations from business leaders and up and coming stars in the commercial real estate industry in Canada. Our guests will share their unique career journeys, passions, and advice on what it takes to be successful in this industry. This podcast is brought to you by Highview Partners, connecting people who perform in Canadian real estate. I'm your host, Nicola Denning-Miller, and today I'm joined by Dave Merklinger, who is a marketing and sales senior vice president and has carved a successful career in residential development over the last 20 years. His father was a commercial developer and his grandfather was the head of one of Toronto's largest construction firms who built many of Ontario's large shopping malls, so this industry is clearly in his blood. Dave has participated in the marketing and sales of over 50 residential developments spanning 11,000 units and he and his teams have won well over 100 awards for their contributions to the home building industry. Dave, hello, and thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Wonderful. So as you probably know, we've had some really interesting guests featured on this podcast over the last couple of years. But I do believe that you're the first specialist in the sales and marketing space. And that is an area of real estate that I particularly enjoy recruiting in. Um, obviously, it seems to attract really passionate, very creative, lively characters such as yourself. And um, it, is, it is competitive, too, in the sense that, you know, it's ever evolving. You know, you have to be innovative. You have to be brave to try new things to meet what, what I'm assuming is ever changing consumer expectations. So thank you again for being here. I, I anticipate that our listeners are going to really enjoy this conversation as much as I am. So without further ado, I would say let's jump straight in. So let me ask you, how, how do you feel the real estate landscape has changed in the last 10 years? So in the past 10 years, I think what we've seen is a massive shift into the digital and e-com space. Um, it was really, really difficult to break through that ceiling because of so many requirements on purchase and sale agreements and fintech requirements. Uh, but now what we're seeing in the space is the opportunity to buy real estate right from your living room. The technology has progressed quite quite rapidly uh, in meeting all the requirements from a legal perspective. Um, and it's also removing the need for physical retail spaces, uh, which is kind of very traditional for most home builders to uh, focus on uh, to generate sales and, and excitement in a project. So massive change into the digital world um, and removing all things to do with print um, and even out of home uh, awareness elements have totally changed. Uh, so we focus most of our attention in the digital landscape and how we can get people uh, be convinced and actually make the transaction online. And it is crazy, isn't it? That it's likely the biggest purchase that we'll all you know, ever make. And a lot of these purchases are happening you know, without even being physically present. <laughs> well, and, and the technology has supported that through you know, photorealistic renderings, people can actually go through the space in a 3D model on their web browser. Uh, so, you know, you're not really buying sight unseen as you used to from a more traditional, uh, you know, black line floor plan. You can actually be immersed in the space before it's ever built. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I mean, in, in terms of um, consumers buying habits and the way that they've changed, how are developers approaching projects these days? Um, I'm not sure that the buying habits have changed necessarily, but the lifestyle promise has changed. How we're living in our homes has changed. And what that's done is it's changed our approach on how to develop and design the product itself and focus a little bit more on the purpose of the product rather than the product itself. Uh, so things like, you know, removing soaker tubs from the uh, traditional principal ensuite. And making that an option for people who want it. Um, generally speaking, though, most people don't need it. They want their shower in their ensuite. Uh, even thinking about uh, the traditional dining room uh, going by the wayside. You know, they want more flexible space. I mean, the kitchen is the hub of the home. 
And so they would uh, traditionally move away from a dining room and have a larger kitchen space with maybe, you know, six seats at an island with two sides or three sides of seating. And that becomes sort of the hub uh, for all your dining and entertaining. So it's really a product uh, development change uh, that we're seeing um, uh, through the buying habits of, of home buyers and investors uh, in how people live inside their homes. Just talking about um, interest rates at the moment, I mean, interest rate hikes are obviously going to impact the real estate market. Can I ask what, what you're seeing right now compared to six months ago and what you think we can expect in 2020, 2023? Uh, there's, there's, I mean, the interest rate uh, increases uh, have been fast. And so, you know, they, they do stoke a little bit of fear um, from, uh, from the marketplace. Uh, but I think what what we're seeing is the ones who understand that a, a real estate purchase is, is more long term. Uh, it's not a, a pump and dump scheme. And so the ones that understand that, you know, you, you have to uh, buy and sell real estate in very short periods of time uh, to be at risk of a potential loss, uh, it becomes a carrying cost game. And so even with the interest rate increases that we've seen over the last six months, uh, that really means a difference of about $250, $350 a month difference uh, in that carrying cost on an average $750,000 uh, purchase. So, you know, the, the, the actual cost of ownership isn't all that much higher, uh, but it sounds like it is in the media uh, with respect to that. I think the savvy buyers uh, understand that uh, interest rates are at the highest they've been in a long time, but are still arguably quite low. Uh, and so, you know, long term, I don't have a crystal ball in terms of what the economy will do and, and those kinds of things. The only thing that I would do is, you know, coach the buyer uh, in how to protect themselves from these uh, future rate increases. And so there are a lot of lenders uh, who work with us and other builders uh, who will cap rates and lock a rate in as a guarantee up until the time they occupy or, or uh, close on their home. And so you've got buying certainty options. Uh, and once you get into that, that particular mortgage, you know, you can get into five-year fixed rates uh, and, and lock in some certainty for it. So even though there's some increases, there's still lots of opportunity for certainty and mitigating risk uh, for your real estate purchase. In, in your opinion, Dave, I mean, other than when you can afford it, when is the best time to purchase a condo? As soon as the launch happens. The, if you can be the first buyer uh, on the ground, I mean, the only thing that the, 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 the sales process is going to do is increased uh, pricing over time. You know, as the uh, project picks up popularity and steam and even, even as you get towards the, uh, the last, you know, 20% of, of inventory, uh, you're, you're dealing with the highest petition, uh, uh, the highest prices possible. Uh, so getting in at the ground level, being the first to purchase uh, and moving quickly on your purchase is always going to mean the best uh, opportunity, buying opportunity. Just out of interest, if you are one of the first to purchase, what percentage of buyers do you think actually have the intention of living in that space versus renting it out or, or flipping it for a profit at a later date? Um, currently uh, in my um, in my experience, we're seeing about a 70-30 split in the mid-rise and high-rise markets. Uh, so 70% being uh, investors who intend to either uh, do an assignment for a quick flip or even uh, stay as a landlord and, and rent the unit out. Uh, on the low rise, uh, it's actually flipped. Uh, you're seeing about 20% of those buyers being investors uh, and 80% being the end user. So it really depends on the product. Uh, but it also depends on the region, too. Um, the, the economic state of any given city or town is going to be really important to uh, an investor uh, to understand you know, who already lives there, who would be interested in a rental opportunity, and what that rental market rate would look like. So that usually goes into the factors of, of the investment purchase. So what challenges do real estate developers face? with ever-changing consumer expectations? Uh, I think it's this one is always going to be quality. Um, the, the expectations of quality are ever increasing because of that erosion affordability, I would say. And so the, the perception in the marketplace is they're paying so much. 
uh, again, being the largest purchase that uh, anybody will make in their lifetime, people want more value for their money, especially when these prices have risen so sharply. So, you know, if you bought a new car, would you be okay with it being delivered with defects off the line and having to fill out a warranty 30 days later? Or, you know, if no one called you to tell you that it was ready for pickup, it's not impossible to deliver a defect free home. Um, and so the buying experience is where you really build your process around for that perfect delivery. And I think, you know, with that quality, with value in the purchase, uh, you'll be able to develop uh, some repeat purchases in, in home buying. So when, when it comes to affordability, and obviously that's a, a hot topic at the moment here in, in Toronto in the GTA, what problems are you currently seeing? Uh, unfortunately, I think the young um, first time home buyer crowd has almost been completely priced out of the market. And mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of sad, unfortunately, first time home buyers have to really stretch themselves just to get into the market. Um, you know, I, I think the, the best rule of thumb is, you know, home home owning costs should should be about 35% uh, of your uh, monthly income. And so I, I'm seeing buyers stretch themselves to 65, 75. And that's where these uh, interest rates will really take a toll, um, you know, for, for people who have bought, you know, two to three years ago coming up on their five-year fixed rate renewal. Uh, you can see some, uh, some changes happening there. But um, I think, you know, you, you have to be able to live well um, on, uh, on your income. And I, I've, I've said in the past, you know, if, if you're a landlord and you can't afford your investment purchase without somebody else's rent, well, it's actually your renter that's providing you housing. Um, so the, the, the opportunity to buy in uh, and actually have shelter, something that you own, I think is really important to our economy. Um, and it's very, very important to the young, young homeowning crowd who aspire uh, to that type of lifestyle. So uh, it's something that we focus on uh, quite a bit uh, in my current role, uh, where we actually try to identify uh, through voice of the customer surveys, uh, where is the value uh, perception? You know, do we, do we go with uh, soft closing cabinet doors versus removing a pool as an amenity um, and making those changes to the product so that we can drive pricing downwards uh, so that we can have more opportunity for first-time home buyers to come through. And essentially in doing that, what we're doing is we're expanding our market opportunity to bring more buyers into the frame. Widespread argument that I've heard from current renters who wish to buy a home is that they can afford to pay rent and yet they don't qualify for a mortgage, which would be a similar amount. And obviously the irony there being that they're likely paying else at someone else's mortgage. Um, is rent to own the solution if, if you can't get a mortgage? I mean, what, what are the options for this demographic? Uh, there's actually uh, quite a bit of alternatives uh, for those who don't seemingly get qualified on their first crack. I mean, the, the, the tier one lenders uh, are going to be the ones that you want to work with. Those are the ones that we uh, would only sort of approve from a mortgage pre-approval perspective on a purchase. But, um, you know, there, there's more than four banks in Canada and there's more than four lenders. And so it's always important to you know, work with maybe a, a mortgage broker or get multiple uh, banks working for you in looking at what you could potentially borrow. But I also think it has a lot to do with um, how much you can save, uh, how much you can put down as a down payment to drive your total uh, uh, lending down. Um, and so there's going to be lots of different criteria that goes into those things. I think keeping your credit, uh, credit rating in a way that uh, is positive to the banks, uh, making sure that you're working with brokers for lots of different lending options is really where you're going to see the most success uh, for the ones who you know, may not otherwise be approved in their first round. I have younger children myself, and one of the biggest roadblocks for them is obviously going to be affordability. I mean, wages aren't rising as fast as home prices, and many are going to be burdened with student loan debt. So, I mean, I'm predicting that most aren't going to be able to meet down payment requirements. Um, I, I actually read recently that a lot of millennials now aren't hopeful that they'll ever get on the property ladder. So how do you think Generation Z and Alpha are ever going to own a home? Uh, it, yeah, it, it certainly has been. I mean, the affordability 
started to really erode in uh, in 2012. Uh, so it's been going this way for a, for a good decade. Um, mm -hmm. But this is where we see uh, the decision making be less um, uh, location related. And I think even going through the pandemic and the opportunity for all this remote work um, and, you know, the digital nomads of the world, uh, you have an opportunity now to drive until you can't afford it. Um, and you don't have to worry about that commute. And so all of these uh, bedroom communities, I call them, or, or um, sort of outside of the, the metropolitan, you know, there are still quite a few affordable options for home ownership. And if you have the opportunity to be remote uh, with your profession, uh, these are the opportunities that I think young people need to sort of gravitate to, um, both with working with their employer to making sure that they have an opportunity uh, to have the lifestyle that they, uh, they aspire to, uh, but also being having um, uh, the opportunity to be uh, in a more remote area. And I mean, I, I live in a, uh, in a small town just outside of Hamilton, um, and it's uh, great for me in the sense that, you know, it's a quiet place to raise a family, but it had affordable options for me uh, with the number of children that I have. Uh, you know, I needed a lot of bedrooms. And so being downtown in a metropolitan core, um, there's no way I would be able to afford that, even, you know, having purchased multiple homes uh, throughout my lifetime. So it really depends on what you're willing to do as a location perspective. Uh, and what type of product you're looking for. You know, I've heard a lot recently about, you know, folk that are wanting more communal lifestyle or, or co-living with like friends and family. And I think like you said about COVID, you know, people's situations have changed. They can live outside of the city. But I think also, I think people realise that they were feeling quite isolated and, and lonely living on their own. So it doesn't surprise me that co-living is a rising trend where you I guess you have your own space within common living areas and that poses a more affordable price, but you still get to enjoy high quality features and amenities in prime locations. I think a lot of developers these days are looking at developing multi-generational co-living projects. Have you, have you heard much about that, Dave? Uh, we actually pioneered something in the low rise market uh, specifically for this purpose. We called it the cohab. Um, and what it was designed to do is cater to the home buying market that was either multifamily, uh, multi-generational, uh, or even two single parents with maybe a teenage daughter or son uh, who couldn't really maybe otherwise afford a home on their own, uh, but were close enough that going in on a purchase together uh, was, uh, would make sense for them. And so what this Cohab product did was it was an optional second floor plan for the home. Um, An optional meaning we were able to launch a community without risk of having only cohab uh, product available. It became an option for the folks that needed it. But what it did is it changed the second floor. It changed the second floor so that it, we had two same sized principal rooms with principal ensuite. It then had two second bedrooms, both with their own ensuite and two laundry rooms. And so a lot of times we would deal with multifamily or multi-generational purchases. And, you know, there were, who, who, gets, who gets the big room with the ensuite? And so what this did is it created a level playing field for two groups who wanted to buy into one home so that you didn't have to have that uh, jockeying of who gets what and, and where. Everybody had equal representation in the home from a, uh, from a second floor perspective. And then this is where, you know, the dining room was removed and the kitchen was made larger uh, as a standard in, in the product. And so we didn't sell many of them, but we did sell three, uh, which was, you know, less than 1% of the whole community. But the, those three people were then, or those three uh, homes uh, were then able to make the purchase. And that, that was enough uh, for what that particular builder was trying to do. So there are lots of ways that you can develop your product around cohabitation. Uh, and that was one of the many examples that we've we've done in the past. That's really cool. I mean, b because of this, there's obviously going to be a demand for some seriously creative mortgage solutions as well by lenders. Um, but, but it's great to hear that developers are offering different types of product and you don't know what you don't know. And, and I think once the word gets out and people realize that this is available to them, 
I think it's going to grow in popularity. So let's just change direction a little bit here and talk about green technology and sustainability in the residential sector. So how are developers responding to this and what comes into play when designing the products? Uh, so I'll start with what comes into play when we're designing product around sustainability and sort of the, the, the green features, if you will. So what comes into play are two things. It's going to be the estimated cost to complete that feature, uh, because ultimately that's going to drive uh, the, the, the sale price of that, um, of that piece of real estate. Uh, but we also have to look at it from an investor perspective, not from a home buying investor perspective, but actual like project partner investor. Um, and so a lot of these multifamily, uh, multi-institutional uh, or institutional investors actually are looking to have sustainable projects as part of their portfolio. Um, and so we have quite a, a, a need from our investment portfolio side to say sustainability and green projects are what we're looking for. But on the other end, for the buyer itself, the buyer actually doesn't always want to pay the premium for what that feature is. And so there's certainly a, a push and pull with respect to what builders would want to do on sustainability uh, per project or, or otherwise. But I think generally speaking, uh, and similar to the way um, the car manufacturers are heading, um, and even uh, with, with um, government policies, most of the building uh, is leaning towards sustainability options. Um, you know, the amount of waste that can happen on a construction site can sometimes be alarming. And so I think it's um, uh, corporate social responsibility uh, elements that really play into uh, what a builder should be doing from sustainability um, and, and making sure that we're uh, leaving the project uh, in a better place than, you know, all the trees that may have been taken down to get there. Mm. You know, I was reading a study a little while ago that was conducted by um, a, a large utility company, and they said that 89% of prospective buyers, they want sustainable homes that are kind to the planet, and 49% um, you know, explained that spending more time at home during lockdown had encouraged them to consider an eco home. So I think green homes are certainly you know, gaining ground with buyers and, and energy efficiency is, is becoming a super important consideration but i guess it goes back to the question is can, can we have both can we have you know green and affordable i think green actually turns into affordable it, it it promotes affordable and i think about it from again a monthly carry-in cost for a homeowner in what their utilities might look like um, and so if uh, a builder is able to incorporate uh, energy efficiency features uh, or even um, uh, you know, water recycling or um, off the grid energy options, you know, you're, you're, you have an opportunity to drive down the cost of living. And so despite maybe interest rates increasing on a mortgage, uh, you may be able to shave 30, 40% uh, off of your actual utility costs in having those features. And so it's actually a great way to drive affordability so long as the the actual construction cost for that feature doesn't put the purchase price uh, into a situation where the perceived value is eroded. Yeah, and, and I guess it's easier to do this with new product as opposed to retrofitting old product as well. Yes, but there are great opportunities um, from a condominium perspective as well uh, for um, uh, the condo board to be able to incorporate uh, EV uh, charging stations. I mean, most car manufacturers are looking to be fully EV by 2030, 2040, whatever it is. Uh, and so there actually are a lot of aftermarket, uh, after completion, post-construction uh, options for energy efficiency uh, elements that actually contribute to the affordability of the community. So it's great to see those. So as technology advances, many aspects of business obviously advance with it. And we're, we're seeing a lot of innovation in our industry uh, using cutting edge technology, which is changing the way that business is done and the way that real estate is sold. So how has real estate marketing changed and what trends are you seeing? 
so for the marketing end of things, digital, as we've talked about, is is changing our lead generation game. But we have also um, the opportunity to um, uh, respond to a customer's unexpressed needs. Uh, and that's through marketing automation tools and understanding that customer journey across the home buying exercise. Um, you know, from the time they purchase a home and sign a purchase and sale agreement to when they actually move in can sometimes be, you know, two, maybe even three years. Uh, and so having radio silence during that process isn't uh, ever good. Uh, and so knowing what the customer touch point map looks like and being able to uh, connect with them at the right time along their home buying journey has really changed uh, the home buying uh, process for a lot of home builders. Um, but what it's done is it's reaffirmed the trust in that particular home builder uh, with their buyer. And so um, it's helping smooth the buying process out um, on the tail end in helping people move and get prepared for mortgages or set up utilities. And automating that whole process uh, allows us to deliver that customer experience it, it, on a consistent level from customer to customer to customer. Very similar to uh, how Disney does it. The experience at Disney is consistent throughout. Um, and so digital and marketing automation now allows us to do that uh, and make sure that customers are satisfied with their purchase. I had a friend buy a condo during COVID and she was just telling me of all the kinds of tools that the realtor was using. Um, interactive maps, I mean, this is for all the things that you know, but interactive maps, videos, um, there was drones for like an aerial view so that she could really sort of get an idea of, of, of the neighborhood. Um, you know, 3D virtual open houses. I mean, like th this is nothing like it was when when I bought my first property. So, so you know, she can actually see the property state, the interior details, the furniture, and then you know determine the fit before she actually then had to physically you know make the final decision in person. But I was just so impressed with how far we've come. It's very similar to our remote working element, right? We've we've had the opportunity now to have so much collaboration. Uh, on, a, on a remote level uh, that you're seeing buying happening in the same way. Uh, we're using, we're getting comfortable with these remote tools um, and the technology uh, for, for these 3D immersive uh, um, experiences uh, for homes that you don't even actually need to take a step foot into uh, is really changing the buying landscape, I agree. It's well known that technology and real estate has lagged behind its use in other business sectors. And so I've often thought, you know, why is there a reluctance to change methods or why is it taken this long? Because the benefits of investing and using modern technologies is obviously a given when you're selling to very tech savvy generations. I think actually it's, it's more of a regulatory problem, at least initially in, in uh, you know, breaking through that ceiling of, of e-commerce, if you will, um, you know, through FinTrack um, is is one of the main barriers uh, in uh, ensuring that you know home buying is not a fraudulent um, exercise on a on a per customer basis. And so, a lot of uh, companies um, were actually founded on solving this particular problem uh, in putting point of sale software together uh, that is FinTrack compliant. Uh, so with that hurdle really overcome now for most uh, point of sale software, we now really are truly in a uh, e-commerce environment where you can purchase that home and meet all legal FinTrack requirements and all legal uh, purchase and sale agreement requirements uh, really from the comfort of your living room. It's, it's mm -hmm. changed quite rapidly. Now, you've also got, you know, new technology within the condos that are making life a lot more convenient. Um, what kind of smart devices have you seen that have been most popular with home buyers? Uh, in the mid-rise and high-rise market is where this is most prevalent. Um, these home automation tools uh, get built into the ecosystem of the community or the building. Um, and so it now is becoming a standard feature throughout the marketplace to have, uh, you know, the op opportunity for uh, smart smartphone uh, controlled cameras, uh, front doors, uh, even window blinds. Uh, customers can get notifications on their phone 
uh, through a little smart tag under their uh, bathroom sink, an example, uh, when it senses there's been uh, uh, water coming out where it shouldn't come out uh, as a leak, uh, they can get smartphone notification. So being connected uh, to your home and understanding all of the different elements and how they're working is really what's changed. Uh, we offer um, uh, different uh, electrical outlets that help you understand your consumption. Uh, we offer a leak detection, as I've mentioned, um, security options, um, and just convenience options in, um, in using your home. Uh, automated lights, motion sensors, uh, just taking the smart home technology and building it into the standard offering of these communities. Yeah, I think that connectivity between devices and building systems and homeowners and condo managers, I guess, is just going to improve communication all round, isn't it? Uh, and it gives peace of mind. Um, I'm, uh, I have a lot of personal experience with home automation in, in my current home, um, and it allows a little bit more of a lock and lead lifestyle uh, with the peace of mind that you know, if something were to happen, I would know about it. And I think that has really changed um, uh, the, the mentality of, of the homeowner themselves or even uh, the investor who, you know, might have some tenants in there and, and they can keep uh, not so much a, 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 from a camera perspective and video, but just knowing if there's a leak or knowing if the consumption uh, is, you know, through the roof for uh, some unknown reason. Those kinds of things are quite helpful um, and allow you to have that peace of mind uh, as a homeowner. Just going back to sort of housing affordability in Ontario, just to make sure that there is shelter for everybody. I, I've heard recently that fractional property investment and having percentage ownership in an asset is an idea that's really flourishing in Toronto, obviously for a variety of reasons, but namely the high prices of homes, obviously put them out of reach to a lot of would-be home buyers. So what are your thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I've, I've actually heard of this uh, quite a bit. It's, it's taken from the cryptocurrency model where you're buying a shard or a fraction of a coin uh, in a sense. And, and so this actually isn't necessarily something that um, helps home affordability, especially from an end user perspective. Uh, that's where the cohab element would come in. But from an investor uh, perspective, this is actually quite popular uh, and it's growing in popularity uh, because what it does is allows you to uh, contribute or invest in real estate, uh, not necessarily in just one unit, maybe in a, in a diverse uh, collection of uh, different products, uh, but it also lets you come in at a, at a much smaller uh, take. You know, if we're talking about an average of $750,000 for, uh, for a, a Toronto condominium, you know, one bedroom, uh, that's probably going to sit you in six figures or more from a down payment perspective. And not everybody has that lying around in cash. Right. And so these multiple buyers uh, focusing on that one unit really, really lightens the load and, and reduces the burden uh, from a from a cash outlay perspective and in getting into the market from an investment perspective. Got you. Thank you for explaining that. So you yourself, obviously your career has spanned 20 years and I know that you've led um, the marketing on, on many, many landmark communities, but what was the most exciting project that you've worked on? I think the most exciting one that I've worked on uh, would have been in a very, very small town uh, north of, or sorry, south of Hamilton uh, in a place called Binbrook. I remember uh, actually walking out with the developer at that time into a field uh, and he said to me, you know, we're going to, we're going to build 2000 homes here. And we've got to figure out how to do it. And one of the things that we came up with that made this project specifically successful was uh, real estates, uh, you know, as we know, is location, location, location. And so how do we create a destination out of this seemingly remote place? Uh, and so what we did in this case was we built the community park first before we went to launch for sale. And what it did is it attracted the attention of the existing residents that lived in the region, but it made it a destination for future home buyers saying, oh, okay, yeah, this is this would be a great place to live. Here's where my kids would play, or this is where the school would be. Um, and so it turned it into a destination um, and engaged the home buying market that way. So that I think I'll, I'll always remember walking out into that field and, 
you know, being faced with the challenge of we've got to sell 2000 homes in the middle of nowhere. How do we do that? Right. Uh, so it was a great idea. So what, what goes into a successful launch? Um, I mean, you've got to get the four P's right. Um, if anybody's going through uh, uh, marketing school or, or continuing education in the field, uh, you'll learn about the four P's. So, um, you know, real estate again, location, location, location. So if you get the place right, that first P, uh, you're likely going to do well. Uh, but if you aren't building the right product in that place, then it might not work. And so the same goes for price. If it's not what the market's willing to pay for that product in that place, you're not going to do well. And so the fourth becomes promotion. You have to have communication. What's in it for the home buyer, the WIFM statement, and why should they buy here or elsewhere? So getting those four P's aligned is going to create success in any real estate project that, they, that, that they're looking at. But uh, we also look at it in that's the order in which they make their decision, too. So location being the first, if, the, if it's in the right place, they're still interested. If it's the right product, okay, in the right place, they're still interested. And if it's the right price for that product in that place, they're still definitely interested. And then what are we giving them as that promotion? What sets them apart? What's the key differentiator is that fourth promotion? So we literally buy homes and decision, our, our decision making is in that order. So you are responsible for both the sales and the marketing function. Um, which do you enjoy the most and why? And what skills are required for each discipline? Um, I, I'm going to take the, the cliche answer and say that I actually don't prefer marketing over sales or one over the other because uh, they're entirely different. Um, from a marketing perspective, I think I enjoy um, the creation, um, the uh, the opportunity to uh, create the opportunity both creatively and objectively uh, to generate interest from the marketplace. Uh, certainly that's the most enjoyable part uh, is starting with a blank slate and, and turning it into something. From the sales perspective, what I like most um, is uh, focusing on true salesmanship. Um, in, in the real estate field, um, dealing with objection. I think is one of the most sought after skills that you can have in sales in that, you know, I didn't want to buy this purchase or this particular home uh, because it didn't have what I need. And, and a true real estate salesperson will say, well, did you consider these other benefits um, in relation to what you think your home buying needs are? Because there's value here for X, Y, Z. So dealing with objection and actually helping people understand where value is, I think is the most enjoyable part of sales. Um, so, you know, skills from a sales perspective, as we all know, is always going to be listening skills. Everybody is, has different home buying needs. And so you can't come out, uh, identifying, you know, this is the product and this is the price. And these are all the things we have without actually understanding what the buyer is looking for first. And so asking a lot of questions, and having great listening skills is going to be very, very important from a sales perspective. But then from a marketing perspective, I think you have to really, really put yourself in the customer's shoes. You have to have an ability, uh, almost like empathy, if you will, an EQ, um, to do well from watching buyer trends, understanding what it is that makes these home buyers attracted to any particular community. And, you know, in my agency side of, of working, we often, uh, would name communities and brand them. And it was all about that lifestyle promise. You know, uh, you aspire to something that you want to live in. And so aspire is a great community name because we're connecting that uh, to the home buyer and the brand. So that's, that I would say is the most fun about marketing. That's for sure. So Dave, you initially started out your career on the client side and then you moved to the agency side. And now obviously you're back representing the developer. What are the positives of, of, of both and how has that helped you to get where you are now? Yeah, working on a developer side is um, uh, very interesting because of the complexity of the things that you're dealing with in developing product. Uh, so the developer um, is, is that experience is where you'll understand how the product is developed, how the building comes together. Uh, it's incredibly intricate and complicated. Um, and so you get to learn so much about actually lots of different uh, industries, electricians or plumbing, 
and working with those consultants to design certain elements of the building and what amenities would go into it. Uh, and so, you know, you get, you get a lot of uh, experience into different um, capacities working directly with the developer because you're uh, uh, developing that product. But from an agency side, uh, you actually get to deal with so many different products all at once. Being on the developer, uh, you know, you might launch to maybe three, sometimes four projects a year. But if you're on the agency side, well, now you're dealing with all the creative and the, the, the fun stuff, if you will, um, from an advertising perspective, but you're doing maybe 10, maybe 15 projects a year. And so having that uh, volume of project launches uh, is pretty unique to the agency side of things. Uh, so you're certainly getting uh, experience in, into different types of product, different markets, much faster than you otherwise would at a developer level. Of course, and having that wide perspective is only going to bring advantages, right? Mm -hmm. So you're a busy man. What does a typical work day look like for you? Uh, currently, it's just back to back meetings, really. Um, you know, I, 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 I like to empower my team. Um, I like to lead them. Uh, in ways that uh, make them feel like they're valued, uh, like their well-being is important to me, and it is. Uh, and so a typical day for me outside of, you know, going through meetings and strategy development and working with teams and making sure that they're going in the right direction, um, you know, I like to actually stop by at all of my employees' desks every day and say, how are you doing? You know, what can I do to help you? Uh, because ultimately my role at the company um, in the senior leadership team is to make sure that the staff is successful, has the tools to be successful, and any of the barriers in uh, not being able to complete that work is my job to remove. And, and I know from previous conversations that sort of training and coaching and, and really empowering others and helping them reach their potential is something that you genuinely care about. Um, and I, 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 you, you may be shy to say this, Dave, but I, I also know that you're really proud of winning a number of best boss ever awards throughout your career in different companies. So, I mean, you've got to be doing something right. Yeah, I, I, I really do spend the time with staff um, and it's not um, uh, it's not necessarily one on one time, like, you know, constructive feedback or anything like that. It's you know, somebody comes to me with a question and it's not just giving them the direction on what to do next, but it's focusing on the why. Why would we want to be able to do something this way and what are the results of that? And so every question that comes to me is an opportunity to learn, every single one of them. And so I don't just give answers uh, because that's the easy way out. I actually take them through the process in which I learned what it is that they're asking about so that when they actually go to do that thing, they know why they're doing it, what the purpose of that response was. That's really important. That's right. Now, clearly you're very passionate. Um, what would you say is your purpose? I mean, what, what do you love about your job? Um, I would say that this is best described as the difference between selling houses and helping people find their next home. Again, that, I think that passion really comes from what home buying is all about and what drives customers uh, to want to uh, become home owners, whether it's from an end user perspective or an investment perspective. I mean, most of my family has been in the industry. I mean, my mother's an interior designer and you know, I've gravitated to enjoying those uh, components and, and loving looking at floor plans. And so really getting into how we can um, understand the customer and deliver products in the marketplace that really, really change someone's lifestyle or help them uh, aspire to what it is that they're uh, looking to be from a home ownership perspective is really what makes me tick. Uh, it's a lot of fun that way, uh, but it, it, it has some impact, um, you know, going from somebody who may be in post-secondary education and now being able to afford their first home that's a life-changing situation that most people remember for the rest of their lives. Uh, and so being involved in that process of somebody's life, that stage of somebody's life, I think is really rewarding. I feel exactly the same about recruitment because, you know, finding a job, 
finding a new job, changing careers, buying a home. These are really big events in people's lives. And, you know, you, you have to be value driven. You have to have a purpose and you have to know the impact of what you're doing. So I, I love that, Dave. Um, obviously, there's tons of really cool stuff happening in real estate development right now. What, what's getting you really excited at the moment? All the all the technology stuff. I mean, I'm a self-professed nerd in that sense. So um, anything that uh, we can bring to market, whether it be, uh, you know, uh, unique uh, electronic or uh, electric vehicle uh, charging station capabilities, uh, all the smart home automation things that go into it. Uh, these are the things that I really, really enjoy from a product development perspective. Um, and I think, you know, the Internet of Things is really becoming per pervasive uh, throughout all the things that we do. And so how do we capitalize that on lifestyle opportunities and, and really put it uh, to the forefront of the home owning experience? Um, you know, that that really charges me up. But, you know, again, I think the passion really comes back to finding ways to drive affordability for those first time home buyers and so, you know, equal parts tech and equal parts uh, passion towards affordability uh, really is what, what I, why I do this and what gets me excited about it. Are you looking for a specialized recruiting partner to connect you with the people who perform in commercial real estate? At Highview, we partner with some of Canada's leading real estate companies. From national landlords, institutional investors, REITs and service providers, to local developers, third parties, and private family businesses. We are passionate about the Canadian real estate industry and enjoy discussing what's happening in the market. We also provide insight and advice on hiring trends, compensation benchmarking, career roadmaps, networking opportunities, and much more. Visit us at highviewpartners.ca or contact us directly to discover how we can connect you to people who perform. So we're going into a little bit more personal territory now, which is great. Um, what's had the biggest impact on your career? Um, it's actually the management style that I adopted. Um, I had the, uh, the opportunity of working with somebody early in my career uh, who was seemingly only dedicated to his staff's success. Um, and I remember him very fondly. Unfortunately, we've lost touch. Um, but that was sort of the, the, the kickstart to the type of leadership style that I wanted to adopt. Um, and I think that's uh, really what's uh, set me off in this direction of, of sort of servant leadership uh, in that sense. And so, um, you know, I've really tried to embody that, uh, that leadership style uh, in everything that I do. And, and I guess that really comes back to that, you know, best boss ever um, award that I've gotten a few times, but you know, that's, that's really what drives it at the end of the day is making sure that that staff have an opportunity to be successful. That's wonderful. Now we, we've often asked guests, um, what they've learned from their mistakes. So just to be a little bit different today, um, can you share a mistake that you're happy to have made and share how it's aided you in your career? I think a common mistake, but one that I've certainly made in the past, um, is, um, not focusing on the expectations that you're setting. And actually, when you don't deliver on whatever expectation you've set, whether it be with a customer or a potential employer or anything like that, and you don't deliver on those expectations, uh, I think that's the, the, the hardest lesson that I've ever learned, um, especially from a home buying perspective. I mean, most builders use the same trades. They have the same opportunities from a product development perspective. Uh, and so their, their key differentiators become their quality, but also their opportunity to deliver on expectations. And so, you know, equally informed people seldom differ in that if you're continuing that communication with a customer throughout their home buying journey and they know what to expect, at the end of the day, they're going to be happy with the purchase. Now, knowing what you know now, uh, what pieces of advice would you give your younger self, Dave? To not sweat the small stuff, but know that the details don't make the design, they are the design. Um, and so there's always an opportunity to recover every situation, uh, especially from a customer satisfaction perspective. No opportunity is ever lost. 
um, in every situation is recoverable. It's whether or not you're willing to do the thing that needs to be done uh, to recover that situation and put it back on track. Now, one of the main purposes of us launching this podcast was to encourage people to step up um, within the industry or encourage people to step into the real estate industry. So what suggestions do you have for somebody who might be deliberating a career in real estate marketing and sales? The first thing I would suggest is absolutely do it. Uh, there aren't enough of us. Um, there's always going to be work because we always are growing our population and uh, new homes need to be built all the time. So it's a very, very good industry to be in from that perspective. Uh, but I think, you know, one of the things that uh, I'll, I'll give an example, if you will, on uh, everything is always different. You're never doing the same thing twice. And I think that is um, uncommon in many different industries. And this, uh, I'll, I'll take it back to an interview that I had uh, led with a graphic designer um, who was actually uh, working in packaging at the time, package design on the Tim Hortons account. And I'll never forget her saying, you know, I just want to work on something that isn't brown and red. And that really resonated with me going, yeah, you must be dealing with the same thing over and over and over again. And in home building, uh, you have the opportunity to really never do that at all, whether you're builder side or agency side, uh, because every product, every community that you launch is really like a startup business. You've got a new product. It's a new price. It's a new target market. Uh, it's in a new location. It's got an all new brand, you're, you know, new brochures, new websites, and you get to do this multiple times a year. Uh, so I think it's an opportunity for, uh, for you know, people entering the, the marketing and sales space uh, to really, really uh, get exposure to many different things much quicker than you would in any other industry. So it's, it's a great learning tool for everything to do with sales and marketing at a very, very fast pace. And, and is there any particular education that they should look into or, you know, particular organizations for networking? Yes, absolutely. So again, digital being a huge forefront in, in what most builders are focusing on, um, you know, so certainly stay out of, uh, um, you know, print elements, uh, things like that. But um, anybody who's sort of tech savvy, uh, anybody who's interested in, um, you know, marketing automation and uh, doing really cool things with CRMs and um, you know, those kinds of things I think people will gravitate to. So digital is certainly uh, the forefront of, of where it needs to be. But uh, the industry itself is quite small. Uh, again, there's not enough people in it. And so connecting with anybody in the industry, I think, is going to be an easy way to get your foot into a door somewhere. Uh, because, you know, there's 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 so many different builders. I think on average, there's 2,400 builders in Ontario at any given time. Uh, so there's lots of opportunity to find one that you want to work with. Uh, but I think you'll find that a lot of the leaders in the space have uh, had an opportunity to work with many of them already because it's such a small industry uh, that you can really connect with somebody quite well and quite easily uh, to, to help jumpstart that part of your career. And that's one thing that I do love about our industry is there is such collaboration and willingness to share information. Um, and there's so many exciting things happening at the moment that why wouldn't you want to talk about it? So um, what, what, what would you say is the biggest reward that they can expect? I think you will probably be rewarded the most uh, with opportunity. Um, and I know that isn't necessarily a reward in its, um, in its sort of definition, but, you know, there's a lot of people out there who have professions who you know, can't find work or don't have an opportunity to uh, to get into a space or a field that they want uh, because of, you know, lack of education or lack of means, whatever it is. Uh, the reward in this field is uh, seemingly endless opportunity and getting into the sales and marketing field for uh, home development and home building, uh, again, gives you so many different pieces of experience throughout, you know, electrician, consultant, sales and marketing agencies, creative websites. I mean, you, you really, really expand your capability very quickly. Uh, so I would say that somebody who's entering a career in, uh, you know, say finance, uh, sales and marketing would be 
uh, lagging behind uh, in somebody who's gotten into development uh, just because of the different things that you have to work on so quickly and so commonly. That's brilliant advice. Cheers, Dave. So we like to close with doing a few rapid fire questions. Um, and obviously I'd love to learn a few fun facts about you. Sure. So what is the first thing that you grab for in the morning? Oh, anything with protein, uh, whether it's, you know, overnight oats or a quick egg, um, anything that gives me a little bit of sustenance to, to push me at least through the lunch hour uh, is <laughs> certainly where I go. Did you have a childhood nickname? Um, I had a few, but the one that I can talk about uh, would be Merck. Uh, it's just a part of my last name, but it was easy to roll off because everybody's named Dave, right? Um, so, you know, there's there's a lot of Daves around. So I, I went by Merck. Got it. I'd love to know what the other ones were, but we can uh, <laughs> talk about that offline. Mine, just so that you know, was Frog, because my eyes grew faster than the rest of my head. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what was the naughtiest thing that you ever did as a child? Uh, well, and this was in parent supervision, but I lit a couch on fire and the fire department had to show up. Uh, it wasn't a good, it wasn't a good experience whatsoever. Uh, we didn't know gasoline really affected things that much, uh, but yeah, that was, <laughs> that was pretty scary. I remember it like it was yesterday. And what's something that not many people know about you? Uh, many people don't know about me that um, I was an aspiring musician for so long um, and uh, I actually got into uh, the business uh, education world because I didn't think you could know too much about business, but it didn't start out to be my passion. Um, I just happened to be uh, pretty good at it. So uh, one day, who knows, maybe I'll be a musician again in my retirement, uh, but that's not a whole lot of people know that about me. Cool. What do you play? Uh, I play guitar and I'm also a vocalist. Amazing. Mm -hmm. I play the piano and I play the fool, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dave, as they say in Hollywood, that's a wrap. Um, I really, really appreciate you setting a time aside uh, to share your knowledge, your valuable insights with me and our listeners. It's honestly, it's been really informative, super interesting, lots of fun getting to know you better. And I wish you and your team nothing but the very best moving forward. Thank you very much. That's actually one of the things that we're trying to be is the absolute very best. Thank you for listening to People Who Perform, the Real Estate Careers podcast brought to you by Highview Partners, a talent search and recruitment firm focused exclusively on Canadian real estate. If your real estate team is looking to find the best next hire, or if you're ready to make the best next move in your career, then reach out to Highview Partners today. Follow us on LinkedIn and visit us at highviewpartners.ca.